Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Welcome back to the Your Family Dog podcast. I'm Tina Spring, and I'm joined today by my silenced co-host, Julie Fudge-Smith. I put her on restriction. That's not true. She muted herself. And today, we decided to talk about um, a little bit of a different take on Your Family Dog and the holidays in different ways, because if you're like most moms and dads, Halloween happened and you went, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, here it comes. We're on the downward spiral to the holidays um, with kids and dogs. And so that's sometimes not terribly much fun. Um, It can be sometimes a little messy and not terribly magical. So we want to talk about kind of a plan early now, early in November, a plan for how to navigate that. So that not all of the solutions and and things that we're going to give you to think about today are necessarily going to be the perfect fit for you, but we're going to spitball a bunch of different ideas and hopefully something works for you. So Julie, since I did the long and awkward introduction, would you like to open with a strategy? Sure, I can open with a strategy. So what I would say is that the time to think about the holidays is not when the holiday's happening. We have mentioned this before that we'd like you to start thinking about this perhaps a few months in advance. How do you want to manage your dog at the holidays so that you can work up with a training protocol? But if you're anything like me, that just doesn't happen. And suddenly the holidays are creeping up and I'm going, oh, ha, huh. have to figure out a way to manage the dogs with, you know, 14,000 little kids running around. So one of the things that, that we did a few years ago, we had three dogs. We had a flat-coated retriever named Bingley and a golden retriever named Hudson and a Bernese Mountain dog named Buckley. So there was a lot of dog. But what we found for Thanksgiving was my daughter, who was living home at the time, Emma, and I came up with a strategy. We thought about this in advance. And so we had a whole bunch of stuffed Kongs. I think each dog had a total of three or four Kongs for the day. And then when we needed the dogs to settle or not be on top of the kids or have some time like we couldn't supervise them, each dog had his own space in the house that they were comfortable in that we had set up and had trained them to be comfortable in. So I think Bingley, whose crate was in our bedroom, had my bedroom. Buckley had the office upstairs where he liked to hang out. And I believe Hudson was in either my office or the spare bedroom. And each one of them had some hormones, either in a, in a bandana, a collar, or spray, or plug-in. Each of them had a Kong, according to what they really liked. And then they had some uh, throw a dog's ear music. And so we would give them time with the people, and when we started seeing them getting a little tired of this... They'd be shuttled off to their happy space, given a tasty Kong. And we found that that worked really, really well. But it did require that one of us be paying attention to the dogs. And we also realized that if we couldn't pay attention to the dogs, that was also a time in which they got shuttled off to their happy spots. So that was one way that we found to be pretty effective in managing the dogs. So uh, that's one thing to think about is can you create a happy space for your dog in the house that you know that is going to be quiet and peaceful and they can really work on a Kong and maybe just get away from the hubbub for a while? I think that's really great. And what I would encourage families, if this is a solution that might be a good fit for you, I would encourage you to begin that program now before the holiday so that it's not a new thing that you're doing when you're trying to sit down to Thanksgiving dinner and the dogs are yelling in their perspective spaces because they're like, hey, there's gravy that we're not getting. This is a relatively new phenomenon that I run into with families that everybody brings their dogs home for the holidays. I would encourage that is not a time to try to do new dog introductions. There's enough moving pieces going on. And those relationships between those dogs, if you're going to have them spend time to get together, are really important to build slowly and not fighting over a turkey neck out of the trash can. So do not bring a dog to my house. Like, unless you've cleared that ahead of time, like, 
if my daughter showed up with her dog, I would be like, well, where are you boarding that dog? Because the dog is not coming to my house to make my house crazy during the holidays. My dogs have sufficient craziness without that. So I do not encourage people to take their adolescent golden retriever puppy to the house with the people who have all the white furniture and the perfect Christmas and and ask a nine-month-old golden retriever to navigate that with children and screaming and excitement at Christmas all at the same time. That's just it's an awful plan. It is early enough. Today, we are talking on November 2nd. That's when we're recording this. It is early enough. Boarding is not full. You can totally secure boarding for your dog. I even encourage some people to board their own personal dogs for the holidays if they're having extra people coming in, if they're having grandchildren who maybe aren't familiar with dogs coming in, if they're having people who are afraid of dogs coming into their home. Getting your dog somewhere else so that the humans can enjoy their activities is a huge blessing typically to the dog and to the family, but it does require planning, right? If you call on December 23rd, people who board dogs are just going to be making weird faces at you over the phone. So I always tell people it's better to book boarding and cancel it than to not have boarding secured, whether you're going or whether people are coming. What I wanted to say was, um, apparently I didn't make that clear is that we did practice this with the dogs ahead of time. Not only did we think about what we wanted to do, but we made sure that each of the dogs was comfortable in the space that we had chosen for them by leaving them there at different times. Also too, the golden retriever was tended to resource guard a bit. So we knew that we couldn't put them all in the same space because Hudson would end up taking everybody's Kong. So also to know the nature of your dogs, don't just think you can give everybody a Kong and have a free for all in a room that might not work out very well. It might be very stressful to them. So the idea of setting each one up with his own space where he or she can be quite comfortable without fear of Fido, brother Fido taking my Kong. uh, Think about that as well. The other thing is I really liked what you said about building relationships ahead of holidays. This is not the time to try and and build relationships. Well, because for one, if you are the hostess, which that seems to be me most of the time, I got to tell you, I don't have a lot of time to spend building relationships between dogs because I am busy stuffing turkeys and baking bread and setting the table and getting things for the grandkids to do. And I don't have time to do it. And it's also a fairly stressful environment. So you don't want to have to try and introduce dogs to one another when they might be feeling kind of like, this is one wild day. And now you throw yet another thing in there. Because what can happen is what we've talked about before, which is trigger stacking. So you've got an environment that might be stressful or at least arousing to your dog. So we have all these new smells. We have all these new people and all these new sounds. And mom's not paying any attention to me. And things are kind of crazy. So I am aroused or excited. And then you add another dog on top of that. That might be just too much arousal or too much stress for your dog to handle. You've stacked all these stresses on top of one another. And you might not have the reaction that you want from your dog or that you could have avoided if you had introduced them in a less stressful environment. So Tina, I thought that was a really good thing to say. And if you can't find boarding, one of the things that, that we do, um, there's there's not a boarding facility around here that I'm super comfortable with, but we have a pet sitter and he lives in town. So it's really nice because even on Thanksgiving day, he could stay here because where he lives is just a couple miles away and he can pop over to his parents for Thanksgiving. So what I would also recommend is if you're not comfortable with boarding, get a pet sitter. And one of the things that you're going to want to do is make sure the pet sitter comes over and meets the dog and spends time with it. And even maybe even do a night where you go out and stay out late or spend the night and the pet sitter stays here. So the dog's used to the idea that the pet sitter comes and spends the night. It's worth it to help the pet sitter and the dog build a close relationship And it has really paid off for us because when we go away, and I know that either Christopher or his sister, Catherine, who have both been pet sitters for me, my dogs are just as happy, I think, to see them as they are to see us. And we came home and when we come home from our vacations, our dogs are happy and content and uh, 
that relationship is incredibly important to me and to my dogs. So that would be another option to think about if you're not comfortable boarding your dog. Right. I mean, it's dog bite season, right? Jen Shryock talks about this pretty regularly, right? So so dog trainers who are long in the tooth, who do aggression work and family dog work, dog bite season starts the week before Halloween and ends the week after New Year's. More dog bites traditionally happen during that time frame than the rest of the year combined. It's easy to understand why, right? Houses are more complicated because we've got decorations of people in and out. The weather outside is frightful for some of us. And so kids and dogs are not playing outside as much. It gets compressed in the space. And parents are distracted and tired because they're overwhelmed by the holidays as well, right? So now you add on, I think for every dog trainer, we're all a little bit terrified of this Christmas because people are out of practice. They haven't been doing the interactions with family get-togethers quite the same way the last three years. And so a lot has changed. Like Grandma Mildred might not have the same kind of ability to move around that she did before. She might be a little bit more hard of hearing, so she might be yelling more. Memories may have been impacted. Like the chronic stress of the last couple of years have significantly changed all humans, myself included, and all dogs. That chronic unrelenting stress significantly impacts brain function. It doesn't matter how smart or pretty you are. doesn't matter how much you work out. It's just a natural occurrence in all of this. Some of us, of course, are impacted more than others. So when I think about the holidays and I'm coaching a family through that, there's a lot of, we'll take a measure of where, like the people who are going to be coming to your home, how, how are they all functioning and how might that impact the behavior of the dog. Likewise, how's my dog? Like if I have an adolescent jumping up 90 pound puppy, which I do, Aunt Mildred with balance issues, who's 157 years old and very sweet and frail, it, he's not going to be able to be around her. Like that's just not going to be a combination we're going to do, right? Or Mr. Who refuses to come when called. He can't be loose when people are coming in and out through the door because he's going to be in Nebraska, not answering to his name. So taking that measure of, Okay, who had new babies? Are the sweet babies from three years ago now bratty seven-year-olds, right? Like what changed? And it's not going to be the picture you remember it was. It's just not. So it's a more complicated thing than when this was consistently happening and we just kind of all took it in stride because family came and visited three or four times a year and we all kind of knew what that looked like. Right. One of the things that you can also think about, if most of you people are coming locally, like for us, Brad's cousin and her two Chinese daughters are coming down from Cleveland to spend Thanksgiving with us. So they'll be staying with us. But the rest of my family, my kids and grandkids, they live locally. So one of the things I've been thinking about is timing. You know, what I could do is since the dogs will have the stress of having people stay here, which they they actually seem to really love, but saying, okay, they're here for breakfast. And so why don't, you know, we're playing on Thanksgiving dinner. I'm making up times here, say three o'clock, have the kids and the grandkids come more like two o'clock rather than noon. So what we're doing is reducing sort of the amount of overlap time for the dogs. So you can also think about sort of staging things, you know, and making sure that the dogs like, so if the cousin is here with her kids in the morning and dinner's not until three or four o'clock, that still gives me an, and the, my other family's not arriving until one or two, gives me a chance to get my dogs out for some exercise and a nice walk and a good sniffari so that when the grandkids arrive, they've already burned off some of their energy and are more relaxed. And so it's not everybody all the time on my dogs and, or on me, you know, because I'm the main, you know, chef and bottle washer and setter upper and cleaner and some jack of all trades. So it's also easier on me if I can stage and know that there's a predictable time when things are going to happen where people are going to arrive, it makes it a lot easier for me to more effectively manage my dogs. Yeah, I mean, my experience in 
when I get the bike calls, and I do, I get them every year after the holidays, when we get the bike call, when we pull it apart, it would have been really easy to avoid, right? In hindsight, it's super easy to pull it apart and go, oh, well, there was a late delivery from Amazon. The dog snuck out the door because I was putting the turkey together. And so someone, else, one of the kids opened the door and the dog got out and there was all sorts of drama as the dog ran through the neighborhood. And then the dog got cornered to get catched. And like, as we talk through what happened in the two or three days leading up to the incident, super, super predictable that that dog got trigger stacked. Frankly, the humans were exhausted and touchy too. And then we had an incident. And so what's interesting is I think nobody thinks it's going to happen to them until after it happens to them. Absolutely. I have found it to be exactly the same way. And, and it, it's actually happened to me when we had a dog that, that bit our grandchild. I didn't think it was going to happen. And it did. And it's one of those things where, yeah, you can pick it apart sometimes. But you know what? Sometimes... It, it, it does. It does happen, and, and for, for all the the best intentions and the best planning, things can still go south on you, and they can go very quickly. But to learn from hindsight, I was thinking when you were also saying about you know pulling it apart. If I know when people are arriving, if we have the set time, I can make sure that the dogs are outside in the yard when everybody comes in the front door. So that nobody's on top of each other. And I have found, this is another tip I was going to tell people. What I have found is my dogs manage people coming into the house much better if they come in and they get settled. The coats come off and the packages get put down and everybody gets a little bit settled. Then I bring the dogs in to meet them. The dogs are not there at the initial excitement at the door. They're coming into a situation that is calmer. And I have found that has really helped to keep them calm. So if you know when people are going to be arriving at your house, plan to have them come in and get settled, then bring in your dogs to greet them. The dogs don't have to be at the door to greet them. I agree. I think, I don't know, it, it, we're, we're November 2nd, right? I, I had a goal to lose 20 pounds this year. I'm exactly 24 pounds away from that goal at this point. So I managed to make it worse now, not better. So maybe I'll reach that goal of losing now it's probably 25 now. Just while I sat there in that minute, it probably went up a pound. I'm right there with you. So probably while I have the best of intentions that I would be 25, now it's probably 26 pounds lighter by the end of the year, 27. (laughs) The reality is that may not, I may not pull that off. I may not pull that off and that's okay. What I can't do is ignore the fact that I'm not doing that right? It's not going to be done. So it's not as if Dovey is suddenly going to become a PhD level trained dog between now and Thanksgiving in three weeks. That's not going to happen. He's still going to be a lunatic. So then I have to decide how, how am I going to make that survivable and hopefully pleasant for all of us. So that might mean moving his crate into a different space so that he's not barking at us through dinner because he thinks that's super funny. Because If I plan to just crate him, it'll rain. It'll rain for five days on Thanksgiving. And then I won't be able to put the stupid dog outside and have him bark outside. So there's just a lot of, I could plan on doing a whole bunch of training. Or I can admit that I'm just trying to survive the end of the year and getting every, trying to get everything done. And, you know, the cobbler's kids have no shoes. So he's not going to be perfectly well-trained by Thanksgiving. He's just not. So then I have to navigate from there. I can maybe set a goal that he's perfectly trained and I'm 28 pounds lighter by this time next year. That's a better chance that might happen. But there's a little bit of, I think people are like, oh, it'll be fine. I have every intention of working on this. So it'll be great. And then we don't because we're busy because we have we have life happening and people are kind of crabby. So I much more am about the world, the life I'm in than some utopia that I hope will happen without any effort on my part. So 29. Yes, I'm, I'm in the, I had 
10 more pounds to lose. And yeah, I kind of feel like as I'm sitting here, sort of salt is absorbing into my system and I, my weight's going up incrementally by the minute. But I think that's right. I think it's a healthy thing to do is to be realistic about what you can and cannot achieve and to be realistic about what it is you want to. Like I really thought that by this time this year, I would be completely through cooperative care and my dogs would lay down and hand me their paws to have their nails trimmed. It's not happening that quickly. <laughs> I think that maybe in two years my dogs will do that. But it's one of those things It's kind of like I have all the best intentions, putting together the best intentions with the action and trying to do it for two dogs is really hard. And I'm a trainer and I don't have any kids at home anymore. Right, but you have, what, 87 grandchildren? And you're really active with them. Yes, we have we have eight and a half grandchildren. There you go. So I was close. So it it's one of those things where the holidays are not the time to try to do the training. It just isn't. And the introductions that are going to happen then, the exposures that are going to happen then are really, really important and crazy fragile. So... I'm always like, don't, don't do it. Just don't do it. Like if, it, if those relationships are important, do that in like, I don't know, March when it doesn't like when there's not all the pressure in the system. Well, and I don't know. There is St. Patrick's is. Day. Right. There's just blinking lights that day. Right. So it is totally okay to just say, okay, we're going to plan our way around this. I, I mean, I have a deer family that <laughs> they have, they have a young adolescent dog. They're just taking, she's going to make all the Thanksgiving and then take it to another household that doesn't have dogs. I was like, that's brilliant. Good for you. Right. She's like, I would rather transport my pots and pans back and forth than to try to manage this puppy through the holiday, right? Because the puppy's going to learn all the naughty things. That's what'll happen. We have another client, for example, who's having us do a positive reinforcement-based board and train while they go and visit their grandkids in the Northeast for Christmas. So their dog will have a great time. He'll learn a bunch of awesome stuff. He'll be loved and spoiled rotten on the farm and have a really great time. But they will avoid their dog, you know, annoying their daughter and her kids for Christmas this first year when he's kind of a little bit of a goofball. So that's okay. It's totally okay to go, you know what, we're just going to punt and we're going to change how we're going to do this in a pretty big way so that we avoid a crisis where everybody decides that that's the bad dog. That's the big thing that I get trying to help families through the holidays is that Hurtful things are said. People decide this dog is a bad dog or you're a bad owner or whatever because of something that happens that we could have easily avoided. And again, people are not as resilient as we were four years ago. Hopefully we will become that resilient again. I don't see, based on my interactions with the public, that that resiliency is back yet. I hope spring's eternal, that, that we'll get there, but I don't think we're there right now. So for our holidays are still generally, we like them small. That's kind of a win for us. And to a certain extent, my dogs are used to the setup we do. It happens pretty regularly. Dovey's kind of the, the odd man out in the mix. He hasn't been through that before. So I'll be focusing my time and energy over the next three weeks of preparing him to be more settled during mealtime and when guests are over. So we'll just do small exposures that way. Right. Well, I think that you brought up a good point that I wanted to sort of reiterate and expand on. And that's the idea of realistic expectations and the idea that, you know, this is not the time to try and introduce a whole bunch of new things. And it's kind of like the same thing with, with weight. I think that going into the holidays, this is not the time to think about over Christmas, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, that I'm going to lose 10 pounds. But what I hope to do is maintain the weight that I'm at and maybe lose a pound or two. And I'll be happy with that. And that's a reasonable expectation for that time period. So I think you need to think about what are reasonable expectations for the dog that I have. Now, we've talked a lot about puppies. And I think puppies just really can. I know like my grand puppy, Rosemary, who I adore. And she is the cutest, smartest Aussie on the planet. But she is an Aussie, and so she has a, a, a more energy than the sun. 
so I think that the holidays are going to be challenging for Rosie because there's going to be a lot more excitement and arousal in the household and she can feed off of that. So Emma's doing a really nice job of, and she's been working very steadily on teaching Rosie to settle on her bed. So like we were over there the other day, we took them out for dinner and then we went back to their house to play a game. The kids went to bed and then we, we played a board game and Emma spent the evening teaching, working on Rosemary, settling on her bed and staying on her bed. So she was within like four or five feet of us. She could see us and, you know, talk to us and stuff, but to teach her to really settle on her bed. And Emma's been working on that and continues to work on that every day under different circumstances so that Rosie understands that's a great place to be so that Rosie can be more effectively a part of the family at mealtime if she learns to settle on her bed. But Emma's been doing this for a while, and she will continue to do it. She also knows that if things get really crazy, like they did, we were over there, all the cousins were over there for trick-or-treating on Monday night. Rosie spent a great deal of time in the backyard and in her crate, because that was the best way to manage Rosie on a night where we had eight kids running around in costumes. And so, you know, I think you have to be willing to be fluid and flexible and have more than one strategy. So Emma had more than one strategy. One was let's go let Rosie go out. She's been in her crate this afternoon. So let's let her go outside and run around with the kids for a while. Then we'll put her in her crate or we'll, she'll sit on the bed. Great. But she wouldn't because it was too much excitement. So it was crate or outside. So Emma's working on multiple strategies and is willing to use whichever one is appropriate for the moment. But she also understands that Rosie's just five or six months old. And so her reliability on these behaviors is not the same as a dog who's been doing this for three or four years. So I think you have to put in expectations. The other thing I wanted to mention was not only do we have to have expectations that are appropriate for the age of your dog, be it a puppy or an adult dog, this is also a time to be very careful and protective of your elderly dogs who may find the holidays to be extraordinarily stressful because their peaceful, quiet environment is suddenly very loud. They may be sent much more noise sensitive. They may have some arthritic pain so that, you know, having to move quickly out of the way of kids may be difficult for them or people may be petting them in a way that's inappropriate or uncomfortable for them. So this is not just a how do you manage your puppy. This is also to pay attention to the age of the dog that you have And try to think about management strategies for the age of the dog that you have. So I have two adult dogs that are, you know, they're they're not in pain. They're doing pretty well. I've got some management of them might be easier for me than it would be if one of them was an arthritic old gal and the other one was an obnoxious puppy. Of course, Clementine's just going to live her life as an obnoxious puppy. So I am sentenced to that. Well, you signed up. I did. No, I didn't. Brad signed up. Well, and then I guess that means I did too. And we adore her. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely adore the bad dog. Um, but she is who she is. Right. So so that's kind of what I mean about when I talk about like Dovey in the holidays. Right? Like I know he's going to run it off in the ditch because Clip Clop can't move around this house like, you know, a delicate flower. He does everything big and loud and happy and exuberant and so yeah, like that doesn't really work with a crowded house and toddlers wandering around or, or you know, old people with balance issues. So it there's a lot of management that has to be done. And and again, my dogs don't mind that. They're completely fluent in. They don't always get what they want. There's a lot of times that when I'm talking to a family, they're like, oh yeah, we're going to do this and that. And I'm like, okay, what advantage is there to that? Like why? And I'm just curious. I'm not judging. Do you have I an just, example? Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, why does the dog need to be included during dinner time? Because my dogs aren't included in that ever because they'll beg and I'll feed them because it's hard for me to tell them no sometimes because they're really cute and they don't talk back usually. So while I absolutely have the skill and have trained dogs to lay on a settle mat, when we're eating dinner, I also know that there's absolutely no reason to do that if I can just put the dog in a crate with part of their dinner frozen in a Kong and they're happy and I'm happy and I can just enjoy my dinner and make sure everybody has what they need versus I'm trying to train a puppy at the same time. 
because that sounds awful. I'm not going to do that. So that's part of it. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, why are we making it more complicated? Most of the time I'm trying to talk to families about how to simplify it. Like, okay, if you want the dog on the settle mat while you're eating dinner, fine. Okay. You decide that that's it. That's the hill you're going to die on this Christmas. Okay. Then use a leash and back tie the dog. So when the dog screws it up, he's not under the table where someone drops a cranberry and reaches under the table and the dog gets weird and resource guards the tiny cranberry and everybody's freaking out, right? Like have another management layer there so that you don't have to be on top of it because I love you enough to say you're not going to be on top of it. You're going to be distracted by all the things. And if you enjoy an adult beverage, also a complication. So right. the other thing I was going to say is, as I liked you were saying about the double management, that you tether the dog. So we can't leave the settle mat. This is not a tight tether. I mean, the dog can, can, can move around on the bed. But basically, you're helping them, managing them so that they're successful at the task you're trying to teach them. The other thing I would recommend is something that I have done is sort of a, a double gate system. So, for example, at my front door, I also have a gate across my porch so that should the door get open, there's a gate to stop the dog. Now, hopefully people close the gate, but that's that's also iffy. But we had a dog once where for her, it was very stressful when people came in the house. And so we would put her in one of the bedrooms with the door closed and a gate in front of the door. So that we had that double system so that she would not be able to get out. So that's the other thing I was going to, I'm glad you mentioned that, is think in terms of double management. You know, if you're going to put the dog in a crate in the bedroom, make sure that the door is closed, right? That might prevent people from going in. But the other thing is it would prevent the dog from getting out if for some reason they turn into Houdini and can get out of their crate. So I like the idea of a, of a two system management. Right. And again, I'm not training during the holidays. I'm just not, that's not the time to train because it's going to get screwed up. That's what's going to happen. And believe me, the dog, anybody who's ever run an agility course with a dog and had them smell a banana nut muffin at the top of an A-frame from seven and a half miles away and blows their A-frame contact. And then you spend the next seven years retraining it. Not that that ever happened to me. You learn like, don't, don't screw it up. It's much easier to not run your dog on the windy day that someone half a mile away is baking banana nut muffins and wafting the smell out the window, right? Like it's just your dog's going to blow it and you're going to spend more time fixing it or fixing the relationships that the behavior impacts. Like my dog blows a contact. It's not a big deal. Nobody really cares about that except me. And the judge and the stewards who are laughing at me and my friends who know that that's going to be, I'm not going to be competing with them anytime soon. But if your dog loses it with a family member, it, that is an expensive lesson to try to repair, right? If they knock grandma down and break her hip, that is an expensive lesson to try to repair. So for me, there's just a lot of why, are, like, why, why are, why are we doing it? Why would we include the dog if we had the option to not include the dog in something that's already a little bit of a shaky, wobbly system? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I was thinking it's funny because one of my grandchildren made um, a medieval bird feeder, basically took a pine cone, rolled it in peanut butter. I don't know if they had peanut butter in the Middle Ages, but that's what we used. And then in bird feet. And it's really cute. And there's a string on it and it's hanging outside. And I finally remembered to get it out of my car and hang it up today. Clementine stood underneath it smelling like I smell peanut butter somewhere around here. Like I smell, I think it's up there, but where is the peanut butter? I was just stunned how long she spent underneath the bird feeder looking around going, where the heck is that peanut butter? So these kinds of things can be of a total distraction and the dogs can, can smell stuff that we can't. So you can only imagine how overwhelming all the odors at Thanksgiving or Christmas must be for our dogs that this has got to be like an odor wonderland for them. Right, and the running and the screaming and the playing and the crying, that's usually me. I'm usually the one crying, right? The just, that that is a lot of energy 
that is a lot to navigate. Right. So, so one of the things I would say is, is to reiterate, make sure your dog gets enough breaks throughout the day. Don't expect them to be able to handle all the arousal and all the stress from morning to night. Make sure that you build in a reprieve for them and make sure that it's a happy place they can go to. It's kind of like what we did with the three dogs. And that worked really well because everybody's like, wow, the dogs were great today. I didn't even notice they were here. Well, Emma and I were pretty exhausted by the end of the day. But nonetheless, it was a very successful day and a very successful Thanksgiving because everybody was a lot less stressed. So think about taking a break for your dog. And the other thing is, is if you feel like things are starting to build up, things are starting to build up for you and starting to build up for your dog, I can always say, oh, you know, I think Zuzu needs to walk around the block. I could use some fresh air. Zuzu could use some fresh air. It's okay for you to take five or ten minutes and exit the scene with your dog so you both can come down. I highly recommend that you just take a few minutes alone. Yeah, hi. We haven't checked in all day. How are you, sweetie? You know, here, here's a couple of treats and we'll talk and we'll both take a deep breath and then you can stay here and have a Kong and I will go back in and face Aunt Mabel yet again. Right. Yes. Because there's that, right? Like we get stressed. I don't. I mean, our holidays intentionally are very simple. Like if you don't, if we don't, if all of the people attending don't think everyone else attending is awesome, they're not coming. I'm not inviting them because I want peace more than anything else. I want peace and I want to enjoy my holiday. And if that means that Chris and I spend it alone or with Lindsay and that's it, that's okay with me. I'm totally okay with that because I just want peace. And the good news is Christopher is very much on that same track. We would rather have a peaceful holiday than an enormous holiday. Other people I'm sure have other things that they like to do. So for me, it, there's a little bit of from a, a goal of the holiday kind of standpoint, that's the hill I'm going to die on. We're going to have a peaceful holiday. So then everything that I navigate, the dogs, the cat, who, the guest list, the menu, the cleaning, the prep, all of that, the schedule is going from the what does a peaceful holiday look like to me? And if it's deviates from that, then no. Right. So. Sometimes I can modulate and make things work with a little bit of oddness in there, right? But most of the time, I'm like, no, don't bring your dog, right? And and no, I'm not going to bring my four dogs to your house either because that would be mean and a mess. Like, I wouldn't get to enjoy myself either, right? So it is a very interesting thing that I get a lot of families that everyone brings all of their animals and all of their children and all of their stuff and descend upon someone's household for a holiday. And I, our family never did that. Maybe we're the only ones who never did that, but we didn't do that. We, we didn't never do did that. that either. We never took our dog anywhere when I was growing up. And in fact, when we were living in Virginia and we had the three dogs, I invited Brad's family to our house because there was no, we had tried boarding the dogs in Virginia and was not happy with what we found. And I basically said, I'm not leaving my dogs. And I didn't have a pet sitter. So y'all can come here. And so we did for several years. We hosted Thanksgiving because it just worked out better. And they had no problem with leaving their dog with, with a pet sitter. So it worked out very nicely. But um, no, I, I don't, unless somebody specifically says, you can bring your dogs. And even then I usually say, no, nah, no, nah, I think that, that we'll just leave them at home and um, they'll be fine and we'll be fine. And then that way I can be a lot more help to you. And my, and Clementine, of course, she sheds a clumber spaniel a day. So I don't really want to take a shedding dog to somebody else's house, especially if there's any chance of allergies, because you're going to be, you're going to look white. You're going to look just like a clumber spaniel by the end of the day. And so part of it for me is like, what does the holiday mean? Like, what's the goal of the holiday? Usually it's not, I don't think, I don't think to myself like, oh, I'm going to go see Hefner at Megan's house. I'm going to see Megan. I like Hefner. Hefner's really funny. We enjoy playing with Hefner. But Hefner is not the star of the show. Don't tell Hefner he thinks he is the star of the show. But I'm going to see my friend Megan and her husband Johnny and how awesome they are and that we all laugh and sing and are dorks together and it's fun. 
right? I'm not going to see the dog. That's not what I'm doing. And I love you enough to say the guests coming to your house are generally not coming to see your dog. And if they are, that's like 30 seconds of high, nice dog. And then they're off to the next thing. They're there about the meal. They're there about the fellowship with the people, getting to know their cousins or whatever, decorating the tree or making the cookies or whatever it is they're doing. Generally speaking, I'm hesitant to add dogs into the mix of that. I don't see an advantage. I guess that's part of it. I'm like, okay, what would the advantage be to adding the complication of a 90 pound doofusy Doberman puppy into the mix of trying to make a bird for Thanksgiving? There's absolutely zero advantage. Right. It reminded me of when my girls were were little and people would say, or like, I remember when, when Ellie, this is before we had Emma, Ellie was about one and a half, two. And Brad's aunts came to visit us and they said, oh, we want to take you out for a meal. And I've said, that's, and, and, El, and Emma and Ellie can come too. And I'm like, no, that, that's not fun. You want to go to this nice restaurant, sit down restaurant and have a really nice meal. It sounds lovely, but I have a two year old who can't sit for an hour while we eat, you know, Chateaubriand. And so what is the point? If you want to provide us with a meal, because my husband's in law school and we have no money, yay, let's order a pizza or, you know, bring in Chinese or something. We're in an environment in which you can enjoy Ellie and I can enjoy Ellie. And people say, well, I don't mind that Ellie gets you know upset in restaurants. I said, yeah, but I mind and she minds and the other patrons may mind. And it's the same thing with my dog. If I have a dog who's a puppy and is a jumping maniac and I'm trying to teach him not to jump, the last thing I want to do is put him into an environment where everybody, all 15 people, encourage him to jump on you. It's like, I don't care. I care. I care. I don't. That's not a behavior I want to encourage in my dog. So why would I put my dog into the situation where he's going to practice a behavior that is going to make me upset and is going to take forever to create? And I will tell you, like, people do some silly stuff with dogs. Things that I, like, I can remember telling my daughter to stop biting the dog's ear. She was like 16. I don't know what came over her. She was just like, she was just coming up with weird things, apparently, to do the dog. People, during the holidays, we are all stressed, and so we're distracted. And that distraction removes support for the humans and the dogs, right? So now the dog is, you know, desperately signaling that he would really like to be allowed more agency than he's getting with kids playing with him. And he needs some support, but I'm not there. I'm in the kitchen, right? Or I'm pulling bread out of the oven, or I'm setting the dining room table, or I'm running another load of laundry, or I'm wrapping gifts in the back bedroom. Because while I intended to do it three weeks ago, it just, it didn't happen. So part of it is, it's a it's a fragile system for the dog. There's an awful lot of energy loaded into it and big feelings on everyone's part. And there's only one of us. And so I can't do nine things at once. I it just not well anyway, right? I mean, I suppose with appliances, I can do some things. Like I can wash the dishes and do laundry and bake the bread at the same time, technically, because I'm not the one doing all the labor. But I can't do those things and more. I can't supervise the dog and clean the bathroom at the same time. That's not possible. So the kids are a little bit amped up and nutty. The All of the humans are amped up and a little bit nutty because we're all pulled in a bunch of different directions and we're kind of out of practice. And then the dog is amped up and a little bit nutty. So I just am like, how do I simplify this? Right? So usually on Thanksgiving, Chris puts the bird together because he's awesome. And I put up the Christmas tree and set the table. And then I do stuff with the dogs and laundry because there's it's weird. I, it's like I can't have house guests if there's any dirty clothes. I don't know what that is. It's a weirdness about me. I can't have it house guests weird. if my house is dirty. That bothers me. Oh, if I waited until my house was clean, no one would ever visit. Well, a holiday clean. Anyway, but you're lucky because we have, Brad does what we call show help. I do all the cooking, all the baking, and then he lights the candles. Oh. But he does get to do beverages. I do make him do beverages. and um. He has to talk to people. So <laughs> your job is to talk to people. So I will say I've had some families who said, okay, 
So the adult dog needs 18 hours of sleep a day. That's a three-year-old dog or older. They just made a schedule for when the dog was going to be awake and who was in charge and what they were going to be doing with that dog. So it just, it got assigned. That's great. And I, and that's kind of what Emma and I did that one Thanksgiving. So that's, that's another strategy is, and, and make sure it's something that they can do. Like I can say to Brad, okay, it's two o'clock, put Clemmy in her crate and give her this Kong. And so you're right. I think that the person who, who's making up the schedule, think about who can do what, when, and, and right. how and then, effective they can be at doing it. And maybe you reassign tasks or you remove some tasks. Like maybe you buy the rolls and do the brown and serve rolls instead of baking rolls to give yourself the bandwidth to do whatever it is you're planning on doing with the puppy or the kids. When I was a parent and had little kids, part of the leading up to any holiday was stuffing and freezing Kongs and topples and all sorts of different things and f- getting those all ready in the days going up to the holiday. So the kids already, we were already talking about, well, what are we going to do with, you know, Gus for Thanksgiving? Because he's really uncomfortable with little kids and there are going to be little kids here. So I actually managed to get the kids even thinking about like, Gus doesn't really enjoy little kids. They make him really nervous So we're not going to ask him to do that because again, when I'm cooking for 27 people with three bathrooms in the house, that is not the time for me to be figuring out how to navigate a dog who's afraid of young kids and six young kids running around. Like I'm just going to make accommodations for that dog to make it through the day without an incident. And we'll consider that a win. It's not a time to do an exposure. Right. Which bring, leads me up to something else I was going to say is in your preparations for the holidays, when you begin to think about, okay, so I want you to just start thinking, how do I want to manage the dogs? How can they manage people? How are we going to, you know, where are we going to set up places? Do yourself a favor and invest in a crap ton of cons. Okay. I must have 14, 15 cons that I've accumulated. And yeah, they're kind of expensive. But it will be so worth it to be able to just go to the freezer and pull a Kong out rather than have to think about where is the Kong and what do I have to stuff it with? And, you know, and and is it going to last long enough? Well, if it's frozen, it's going to last a lot longer. So one of the things that I would recommend is invest in some Kongs. Make sure that for that day you have five or six Kongs available for each dog. You may or may not use them, but at least you have them if you need them. Exactly. Right. So it's there's a lot of what can you do ahead of time? And again, I tell people somewhat regularly, if the dog is uncomfortable with strangers in the house, board the dog for like the two days of the holiday. Like just get the dog out of it, especially if you haven't crate trained, if you don't have a good management strategy in place, getting the dog off premises is a much safer answer with having a goal of next year, maybe we can do that work with the dog because maybe we have some different tools. But there, you know, if my goal for 2022 was to run the year 2022 miles and I hit November 2nd and I have 18 miles under my belt, I need to change what my plan is because that's not a goal. It, it's not achievable at this point. I could run anytime I'm awake and it, I still would not achieve that goal. So it's okay to say, okay, well, I had the best of intentions and I expected my dog to be fully trained and prepared for the holidays. He's not. So now what are we going to do so that it takes pressure out of the system? There's a huge difference between having your dog there for the last afternoon that family are staying with you and getting ready to leave to go back home from the holidays than to have your dog there at the beginning. The beginning is kind of a hot mess, right? At the end, the humans are all settled in. They've kind of got their routine. They've got their bearings. Then maybe the last day that everybody's staying at the house, you can go pick the dog up from boarding, bring him home, introduce him to everybody, send them on their way. The dog had a great exposure. Yes, that's a great idea. It kind of goes back to what I was saying about um, getting people in and settled before you introduce the dog. 
I have found that to be a really effective management tool. And and again, if the person interacts with dogs in ways that you're not comfortable with, for example, they let the dog jump all over them, um, or they don't do what you ask when you're asking them to adjust things, or maybe they don't treat dogs the way you treat them, or either being too rough or being too easy on them or whatever, if you're uncomfortable with how those interactions go, then avoid them so that you're not squabbling with the human and your dog doesn't get pinched in the middle. Right. And if you're waiting till the last day, then you don't have four days of this going on. If it happens once in the afternoon, you can exit the dog and say, okay, I guess he needs to go out. He needs to go in his crate. So you're also not having a a continuous repetition of this behavior that you do not want to instill in your dog. I mean, I have had people in climates that it's warm enough to do this, move dog crates out to the garage and just crate the dogs in the garage, right? Put a space heater in there, lock the garage door. If anybody, usually the garage door is close to the kitchen. So you're going to be there anyway. So you can monitor and be like, why are you going out in the garage? leave the dogs alone to just give them a break. That is something that sometimes works. But I think a lot of times the answer, for some reason, people want to do more inclusion. And inclusion requires a tremendous amount of supervision and management and advocacy for the humans and the dogs, which is something that in the whirlwind of holidays, we generally just don't have. Right. And that doesn't mean anybody's being bad. It just means it's really overwhelming and difficult to do. Now, if you want to have the dog out while everyone's asleep watching the football game. No, that's good. Bring the dog out on a leash and do that exposure. The men are all in, you know, asleep watching the football game in front of the fire. That's a great time to have the dog come out on a leash, chill out, chew on a bony, relax with everybody. And then, you know, maybe go for a play outside or go for a walk and then go back to their crate to rest before dessert. Good point. Very good point. All right. Well, I hope that there are some nuggets of helpfulness, if that be a term. Anyway, nuggets of helpful helpfulness in this podcast that you can apply towards the holiday season. But I think the biggest thing that Tina and I are trying to say is don't try to expect too much of yourself or your dog. Just be real. Be real with yourself. Be real about who your dog is and what you think they can reasonably expect. And it's okay to lower expectations on what you think can be achieved and make sure that your dog is effectively and happily managed through the season. And that may mean uh, periodic boarding. It might mean periodic crating. But find something that's going to make all of you happy because our goal is for you to love living with dogs. And you're not going to love living with your dog if you're under constant stress trying to manage them in a situation that is not manageable for you. So take care of yourself and your dog. Have a very happy holiday season. We hope you had a great Halloween. And uh, we'll see you next time on Your Family Dog. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.